Vice Chancellor, Federal University of Agriculture, Abeokuta, Professor Felix Kola Wale Salako, the Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic, the Registrar, the Bursa, the University Librarian, members of the University Governing Council, members of the University Senate, Chief Executive Officers of other institutions, Dean College of Plant Science and Crop Production, Deans of other colleges, Student Affairs and Postgraduate School, Directors of Institutes, Centers and Units, Head Department of Plant Breeding and Seed Technology, Heads of Departments of other, Heads HODs of other departments, Distinguished Academics, all non-teaching staff here present, my Lord Spiritual, members of my immediate and extended family, gentlemen of the press, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Great Funabites! Great Funabites! Preamble. Many plans are in a man's mind, but it is a lost purpose for him that will stand. It is with utmost sense of humility, honor, and gladness of heart, coupled with immense gratitude to the Lord Almighty, that I stand before you today to present the 70th inaugural lecture of the Federal University of Agriculture, Abe Okuta. This is the third lecture from the Department of Plant Breeding and Seed Technology, and the thirteenth from the College of Plant Science and Crop Production, one of the foundation colleges of this university. In this lecture entitled From Generation to Generation, Plant Genetic Diversity, Continuity and Discontinuity, I will endeavor to showcase some of my research efforts and contributions to knowledge in the field of plant breeding and genetics, as well as give suggestions on how to improve our agricultural sector as a nation. Historical background. The earliest evidence of plant domestication found by man has been dated to 11,000 years ago. Initially, selection might have happened unintentionally, but it is very likely that about 5,000 years ago, farmers had a basic understanding of heredity and inheritance, which are the foundations of genetics. The field of plant genetics began with the work of Gregor Johann Mendel, who is often called the father of genetics. He was an Augustinian priest and scientist born on July 20, 1822 in Austria-Hungary. His organism of choice was his organism of choice was Pisum sativum, the pea plant, and he studied inheritance and traits in that plant. And Mendel showed that the inheritance of these traits follows particular laws, which were later named after him. These laws include the law of dominance which says that when two alternative forms of a trait or character are present in an organism, only one factor called an allele expresses itself in the F1, which means the first filial generation, progeny, and that is said to be dominant, while the other allele that remains masked is called recessive. The second law that it propounded was the law of segregation, which says that the factors or alleles of a pair segregate from each other such that a gamete receives only one of the two factors. And the third law was the law of independent assortment, which says that the two factors, that is the two alleles of each contrasting character or trait, assort or separate independently of the factors of other characters at the meiosis or time of gamete formation, and they get randomly rearranged in the offspring that will result from the cross. The Mendelian experiments on plant hybrids was published in 1866, but went entirely unnoticed until the turn of the 20th century when his works were rediscovered and this prompted the foundation of modern genetics. His discoveries, deduction of segregation ratios and subsequent laws have not only been used in research to gain a better understanding of plant genetics, but also they play a major role in plant breeding experiments. And here is a picture of the late Gregor Johann Mendel. In the early 1900s, 
genetic and plant breeding experiments in maize began and a phenomenon called inbreeding depression was discovered. Researchers like Neuroselibert Nielsen observed that by crossing plants and forming hybrids, they were not only able to combine traits from two desirable parents, but the crop also experienced heterosis or hybrid vigor. This was the beginning of identifying gene interactions in plants, otherwise called epistasis. While inbreeding experiments were, while breeding experiments were taking place, other scientists will travel to regions of high plant diversity and seek out wild species that had given rise to domesticated species after selection. Determining how crops change from generation to generation was initially based on morphological features. It developed over time to chromosomal analysis, then genetic marker analysis, and eventually genomic analysis. Identifying traits and their underlying genetics allowed for transferring useful genes and the traits they control from either wild or mutant plants to crop plants. In addition, the molecule of heredity, DNA, popularly called deoxyribonucleic acid, was also discovered, which allows scientists to actually examine and manipulate genetic information directly. DNA is a nucleic acid that contains the genetic instructions used in development and functioning of all known living organisms and some viruses. The main role of DNA molecules is the long-term storage of information needed to construct other components of the cells, such as proteins and RNA molecules. The, segment, the DNA segments that carry this genetic information are called genes and their locations within the genome are referred to as genetic loci, as we can see in this figure one. In this lecture, we'll try and carry ourselves along. These are the basic foundations so that we'll understand genetics because we've always been accused of being abstract in nature, but sometimes we can't help it. Plant geneticists use the sequence of DNA to the advantage to better find and understand the role of different genes within a given genome. Through research and plant breeding, manipulation of different plant genes and loci encoded by the DNA sequence of the plant chromosome by various methods can be done to produce different or desired genotypes that result in different or desired phenotypes. Now, how about plant genetics? Plant genetics is the study of genes, genetic variation and heredity specifically in plants. In other words, genetics can be applicable to all organisms. We have animal genetics, human genetics, but we're talking here about plant genetics. Mendel studied trait inheritance, which means patterns in the way traits are handed down from parents to offsprings, that is, from generation to generation. He observed that organisms, most famously pea plants that he worked with, Pisum sativum, inherit traits by way of discrete units of inheritance. This term, still used today, is a somewhat ambiguous definition of what is referred to as a gene. Plants, like all known organisms, use deoxyribonucleic acid to pass on their traits. Advances in plant genetics and genomics, when used in breeding, help support higher production and cultivation of crops, resistance to pests, pathogens, and drought. Indeed, plant breeding, which is the science of maximizing plant positive genetic traits to produce desirable effects, continues to open new frontiers in agricultural production. Animal genetics, on the other hand, often focuses on parentage and lineage, but this can sometimes be difficult in plant genetics because plants can, unlike most animals, be self fertile Speciation can be easier in many plants due to unique genetic abilities, such as being well adapted to polyploidy. In addition, plants can produce energy-dense carbohydrates via photosynthesis, a process which is achieved by the use of chloroplasts. Chloroplasts, like the superficially similar mitochondria, possess their own DNA. Hence, they provide an additional reservoir for genes and genetic diversity and an extra layer of genetic complexity not found in animals. These are some of the basic differences 
between plant genetics and animal genetics. Self fertilization in plants, which is a very rare occurrence in animals, must be prevented by scientists who want to create hybrids between plant species for economic and aesthetic purposes. For example, the yield of maize has increased nearly fivefold in the past century, largely due in part to the discovery and proliferation of hybrid maize varieties, which almost all of us here we are well aware of. Plant genetics can be used to predict which combination of plants may produce a plant with hybrid vigor. And in this lecture, I want to briefly touch on this seemingly controversial subject, genetically modified crops, genetically modified crops. Genetically modified GM foods are produced from organisms that have had changes introduced into their DNA using the methods of genetic engineering. This technique allows for the introduction of new genetic material through the use of microorganisms into the genome of a plant. It involves the direct manipulation of one or more genes. And for this manipulation, the steps taken, in summary, are threefold. One, the isolation of DNA fragments from a donor organism. Two, the insertion of the isolated donor DNA fragment into a vector genome, vector that will convey the isolated DNA fragment. And finally, the growth of a recombinant vector in an appropriate host. Benefits of genetic engineering in agriculture include increased crop yields, reduced costs for food or drug production, reduced need for pesticides, enhanced nutrient composition and food quality, resistance to pests and diseases, and greater food security. However, however, the potential harm to human health include new allergens in food supply, antibiotic resistance, production of new toxins, enhancement of environment for toxic fungi, unexpected negative side effects, and of course, possibility of abuse. Consequently, there must be controls put in place to manage the negative effects if and when they occur. Genetically modifying plants is an important economic activity. In 2017, 89% of maize, 94% of soybeans, and 91% of cotton produced in the USA were from genetically modified strains. Since the introduction of GM crops, yields have increased by 22%, and profits to farmers have increased by 68%, especially in the developing countries. An important side effect of GM crops has been decreased land requirements. You don't need so large land portion to produce large yield. Commercial scale of genetically modified foods began in 1994 when Carl Gain first marketed his unsuccessful flower server delayed ripening tomato. Most food modifications have primarily focused on crops in high demand by farmers, such as soybean, maize, and cotton. Genetically modified crops have been engineered for resistance to pathogens and herbicides, as well as for better nutrient profiles. Other crops, such as, include the economically important GM papaya, that is purple, which is resistance to the highly destructive papaya ring spot virus, and the nutritionally improved golden rice. Of course, that's been still in process. Of course, there is a scientific consensus, and I want to believe that when the scientific environment here, but those who are not in our environment can also reason along with this. There is a scientific consensus that the currently available foods derived from genetically modified crops pose no greater risk to human health than conventional foods, but that each GM food needs to be tested on a case-by-case -case basis before introduction. However, members of the public, and many are here, members of the public are much less likely than scientists to perceive GM foods as safe. So we must be conscious of this. We may see it as safe, they don't see it as safe. The legal and regulatory statuses of GM foods vary by country. 
with some nations banning or restricting them outrightly and others permitting them with widely different degrees of regulation. And I think Nigeria is in this category of permitting them with widely different degrees of regulation. There are degrees of regulation here, but we cannot run away from GM foods. The concept of genetic diversity. Diversity is the essence of the biological world. No two living things, even maternal twins, are exactly the same. As recognized by Convention on Biological Diversity, there are three levels of diversity. At the highest hierarchy lies the ecosystem diversity, which represents variability among different communities of species. In the next level of hierarchy lies the species diversity, which represents different species within a community. So from the community level, we come to the species level. The third level is the genetic diversity, which refers to the diversity present within different genotypes of the same species. So this diversity can be broken down as seen in figure two here. And so we're going to see more of this later. Genetic diversity is of fundamental importance in the continuity of a species as it provides the necessary adaptation to the prevailing biotic and abiotic environmental conditions. And it enables change in the present, in the genetic composition to cope with environmental changes. As long as the environment will change, the organism must be prepared to cope with the changes in the environment. And genetic diversity is the foundation for survival of plants in nature and also for crop improvement, which we as scientists are striving to uphold. Swingland in 2001 defined genetic diversity as a variation of heritable characteristics present in a population of the same species. It can be described as the degree of differentiation within a species. It includes genomic diversity, which is this diversity at several gene loci. And I hope we can recollect that we've defined what loci are. And this genetic diversity that we see in the species within the genome of an individual, the variation in heritable characters may express itself in the form of altered morphology, morphology meaning the appearance of the organism or the crop in this situation, anatomy, physiological behavior, or biochemical features. Diversity in plant genetic resources provides opportunities for plant breeders to develop new and improved cultivars with desirable characteristics, especially yield and quality aspects of major food crops to provide balanced diet to the ever increasing human population, presently put about, at about 7.8 billion. For the rapidly changing breeding goals, different genes need to be preserved in cultivated and wild crop species in the form of germplasm resources. This can then be used by plant breeders to select superior genotypes, either to be used directly as new variety or as parents in hybridization programs. Diversity, genetic diversity between two parents is essential to realize heterosis and to obtain transgressive segregants. Diversity also helps with respect to adaptability of crop plants to varied environments with reference to changing climatic conditions, which we are experiencing all over the world currently. Genetic diversity is primarily a function of sexual recombination. During meiosis, homologous chromosomes undergo crossing over, which results in the appearance of several new recombinations. Other forces like selection, mutation, linkage, migration, and genetic drift act continuously and they result in continuous changes in allelic frequency in the population, and this affects genetic diversity. Domestication or artificial selection favors few alleles at the cost of others, resulting in increased frequency of selected alleles. Qualitative mutation expresses itself in the form of abrupt changes in morphological, anatomical, or biochemical features. On the other hand, quantitative or micro mutations have smaller and gradual effects which accumulate over time and they bring about changes. 
Mutation may also bring about several chromosomal aberrations in the form of altered phenotype, which may be leader, that is, that can kill the organism, or non leader that will not kill the organism. Mating systems of crop plants affect genetic diversity. Inbreeding reduces while outbreeding increases genetic diversity. And when we talk about this genetic diversity, how do we measure them? Diversity analysis can be carried out using morphological, cytological, biochemical, and molecular characterization. That is, when we have this group of organisms, we have this germplasm, and we want to measure the diversity present within them, we can use any of these methods. A genetic marker is a gene or DNA sequence with a known location on a chromosome that can be used to identify individuals or species. Analysis by morphological markers involves morphological characterization of different entries grown in the field. Morphological characteristics are the strongest determinants of the agronomic value and taxonomic classification of plants. This form of evaluation is inexpensive in terms of cost and technology, but it suffers from the constraints of environmental sensitivity and subjective characterization when compared with the other methods. And what are the other methods? Briefly, let's look at a few of them. Cytological analysis involves the study of chromosome number, chromosome size, secondary constriction in chromosomes, position of centromere, arm ratio, banding characteristics, DNA content, chromosome volume, and so on. However, low resolution limits its application. The third one, biochemical markers. In biochemical markers, proteins or their various variants, isozymes, are separated into specific banding patterns. The isozymes reflect products of different alleles and can be mapped onto chromosomes and used as genetic markers for mapping other genes. They are affected by environmental fluctuations and can be used to construct a reliable genetic map. Molecular markers, on the other hand, involve the study of variation among genotypes or individuals, if you want to put it that way, at the DNA or RNA level. And they are classified as hybridization-based and PCR-based. Use of molecular markers is the method of choice for genetic diversity assessment because of their hypervariability, better genomic coverage, high reproducibility, amenability to automation, being neutral and free from environmental fluctuations, and such methods that have been used and are still being used and which we use in our studies include random amplified polymorphic DNA, RAPD, amplified fragment length polymorphism, AFLP, simple sequence repeat, SSR, intersimple sequence repeat, ISSR, and sequence related amplified polymorphism. Forgive me, we just have to mention them. Many studies on genetic diversity have been reported to use both morphological and molecular markers simultaneously. And these actually were done in many of our studies. Multivariate statistical techniques are used to assess genetic diversity among different strains of varieties of a species. They provide reliable information regarding the real genetic distances between genotypes, and this can be used in the assessment of genetic diversity, classification of germplasm into groups, and in the selection of diverse parents to develop transgressive segregants. We are developing this with a view to coming up with new varieties. And finally, some of the techniques for the multivariate analysis are metroglyph analysis, D2 statistics, cluster analysis, principal component analysis, canonical analysis, and factor analysis. All these are introduction to what we are considering today. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir. I started my research works in 1987 as a student under the erudite scholar, Professor Iyola Fawole, at the then Department of Agricultural Biology, now known as Department of Crop Protection and Environmental Biology. University of Ibadan. Upon completion of my PhD degree in 1994, I got appointment into the University of Agriculture at Beokuta. In the past 30 years of my research activities, I have worked on 
a few of our indigenous crops, including cowpea, melon, okra, African yam bean, and tea at varying degrees of involvement. My studies have been focused mainly on inheritance studies and genetic analysis of both qualitative and quantitative traits. Assessing genetic diversity in crop species using morphological and molecular characterization, which we just discussed a few moments ago. And finally, we looked at intercharacter association. These are some of the aspects I will report today. Now, talking about inheritance studies and genetic analysis of qualitative and quantitative traits, cowpea vigna unguiculata is a widely cultivated crop in the tropical and subtropical regions of the world. The inheritance of three traits, the inverted V-shaped mark on leaves, pod dehiscence, and dry pod color was studied in crosses between wild, weedy, and cultivated species of cowpea. Quickly, when we talk about pod dehiscence, it means that the pod of cowpea, if some of us have seen it before, once it, it is dry, it shatters on its own. And when it shatters, it throws the seed away. And so we're looking at what are the factors that condition this particular trait and how can we use it to incorporate it into cultivated traits so that the cultivated traits will not just be throwing away the seeds anyhow. Both the wild and weedy parents belong to the subspecies Decentiana. In this study, successful hybridizations were obtained on wild cowpea as female parents in contrast to previously reported failed attempts. In literature, we came across the fact that previous attempts failed when the wild ones were used as female parents, but we were able to get some successes. Data collected on the parents, F1, that's the first filial generation, that's what we call F1. F2, that's the second filial generation, and backcross progenies indicated that each of the three traits mentioned earlier, each of them is controlled by a single dominant gene. The wild and weedy lines carry the dominant genes while the recessive alleles reside in the cultivated varieties. So what it means is that if you want to transfer useful traits from the wild and weedy varieties into cultivated varieties, we must know what are the factors that condition these three traits so that inadvertently we don't transfer them along with useful traits. The symbols VSM, DHP, and BK2 were assigned to the dominant genes that govern the traits. And a study was also initiated in cowpea to investigate the linkage relations of 12 loci conditioning morphological characters in cowpea to facilitate selection procedures. And you know, selection is the backbone of plant breeding. And when we facilitate this, we also sought to initiate the construction of a genetic map for cowpea. And these are actually the results of those three traits that we studied in wild and woody varieties. And then, of course, the inheritance of them. Now, using backcross and F2 joint segregation data, these 12 loci were assigned to five linkage groups out of the 11 linkage groups possible in cowpea. So in cowpea, as a crop, beans, the normal beans that we eat, there are 11 possible linkage groups. And we were able to assign the 12 loci, that is the 12 genetic points, to five linkage groups out of the 11 linkage groups possible. Of the 45 F2 and back cross linkage tests between gene peers in this study, 22 suggested independence, while 23 indicated linkage. And we were able to draw this to let us see the relationship between the loci on this crop, the, the, the low side that we study. Prior to the initiation of this study, and we must say this, prior to the initiation of this study, we did not come across any published work that gave a precise linkage mark of cowpea, which could serve as a basis for further study. Perhaps being a, an indigenous thing, crop to us here, mostly studies have not really been conducted as at that time. Now, also in cowpea, the inheritance of seed coat texture in cowpea was investigated by studying the crosses involving seven accessions, that is seven lines or seven parents. This trait, the trait of seed coat texture, is of vital importance in cowpea improvement in the areas of 
cookability and consumer acceptability. Consumers like wrinkled cow pieces, not the smooth one, especially in this part of the country. And it can also be used as a marker, that is the seed coat texture. In two of the four crosses that we did, the seed coat texture was found to be under monogenic, that is one gene inheritance. However, in the other two crosses, the trait was found to be controlled by two genes with complementary effect, giving a segregation ratio of nine, seven to, nine smooth to seven rough for F2 and one smooth to three rough for backcross generation. And this, of course, told us that for these crosses, two were under monogenic inheritance and two were under complementary gene inheritance. The segregation patterns of genes governing the expression of pigmentation on vegetative parts, flower, fresh pod, and dry pod were also studied. For flower color, dry pod color, and pigmentation on vegetative parts, monogenic, that is one single gene action was involved. While for fresh pod color, complementary gene action was observed. And so for this study in Kaupe, we were able to decipher these characters what are the genes that are controlling them? In a study to determine the extent of interspecific crossability between Ebermoscus esculentus and Ebermoscus kali, hybridizations were carried out between four varieties of A. kali. When we talk about Ebermoscus kali, please, Ebermoscus esculentus is our common okra, ila, the one commonly eaten, while Ebermoscus kali is the ilai roku, is the ilai roku popularly called the Roku in Yoruba land. And we made crosses between them. Results indicated that successful intraspecific, when we talk about intraspecific, we mean within the species, intraspecific hybridization between A. Kali, that is between the Bermoscus Kali, intraspecific hybridization was very high, 87%. While interspecific between two species, between A. Kali and A. Esculentus, the, though it was possible, it had low success rate, about 29%. However, seeds obtained from intraspecific and interspecific hybridization, they had high seed germination percentage, and this was very comforting. In the year 2000 and 2001, we made crosses also between two accessions of AKLI, the Eli Roku, with high genetic variability to generate first filial generation, second filial generation, and backcross generations to study inheritance of pod and seed yield characters. In this particular crop, the, 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 the characters of importance are usually the pods that we eat of, of okra, and then the seeds that we harvest for planting for the next um, harvest. So we did that, and generation mean analysis revealed that additive gene effects were positive and they significantly accounted for pod and seed yield characters. Dominance by dominance gene effects were significantly positive for seeds per pod, ridges per pod, and mature pod length. That is how long your okra will be, indicating the presence of epistatic gene action. The high narrow sense heritability estimates recorded for 100 seed weight, seeds per pod, and ridges per pod suggested that early generation selection will be effective for pod and seed yield improvement. So you can select in early generations like fourth, third filial generation or fourth filial generation because in breeding, we go as far as the eighth or the ninth filial generation before you can come up with a successful new variety. And these are the pictures of the Eli Roku, the Ebermoscus Kali that we used. It's high, it's taller than the normal okra. Similarly, eight parental accessions of Ebermoscus kali were hybridized, and the resulting F1, F2, and backwards generations, including parental lines, were evaluated at the lowland ecology of FUNAB. The objective was to study the mode of inheritance and genetic control of pigmentation on stem, pods, petioles, pedunculus, leaf vein, and calyx. PB sense on pods. Now, when we talk about pigmentation, this Eli Roku, Almost all of them, they are usually heavily pigmented. You will see red pigmentation on them. And then when we talk about pubescence, that is they have hairs on the plant part. So we sought to study this 
will be sense. Presence of hairs on the plant parts. How are they? How are they inheriting? Pedoncles and stems, as well as pod orientation. When we talk about pod orientation, incidentally, some of them will stand erect. Some will stand horizontal, and while some will drop. So we looked at all of this as to how are these traits, these characters passed on from generation to generation. The eight accessions varied for these characters. The eight accessions we used, they varied for these three, the, all these characters. And the results indicated monogenic pattern of inheritance for pigmentation on vegetative parts while a duplicate recessive gene action of ratio nine to seven conditions inheritance of pubescence on the stem, pedoncle and pods. Even the pods, they have hairs. And that actually makes them non-suitable for human consumption in many cases on the pedoncle and even the pods. And the gene effects are listed, I mean, given on this table. And the components of the genetic variation that we saw, we have listed them here. Now, the inheritance of pod orientation, whether it will be erect, horizontal, or drooping, conforms to the duplicate gene action, which will give us a ratio 15 to 1 in the F2 generation. The introduction of pure lines and hybrids of okra with improved length and width of edible pods into the cropping system necessitated studies on the combining ability and genetic components of different accessions. In other words, yes, we would like to improve this crop to introduce new varieties that will have improved length and then there will be pure lines and the hybrids that will yield higher than previous varieties. We then study the combining ability and genetic components of different accessions. Seven parents and their 21 F1 hybrids were evaluated. Results indicated that the mean squares due to genetic combined, I mean, general combining ability and specific combining ability for length and width of pods, they were significant. The estimated variance due to the specific combining ability was greater than the general combining ability variance for length and width of pods at edible stage, stages when we can plug them and eat them. Both oligogenic and polygenic actions were observed in the study in terms of the gene actions. Conclusively, there was an empirical superiority of the possibilities of evolving pure lines and hybrid okra with improved length and width into the cropping system. Therefore, we're talking today about hybrid maize. All we're saying is that it is possible in okra to have hybrid okra. And the relationship between the general and the specific combining abilities are also given. Now, we went ahead to also look at an indigenous crop that is so popular, but that not much work is being done on it. And that's melon, egusi, citrullus lanatus. It's one of the most important vegetable crops in the tropical and subtropical regions of the world. Somatic chromosome counts and yield performance were carried out on 20 accessions, that is 20 different lines of egusi melon. Chromosome counts range from 18 to 24. Being an indigenous crop that has not been really worked upon, we first of all saw to look at the chromosome count of this crop. Yes, it could have been reported earlier on, sparsely, but the chromosome counts that we observed range from 18 to 24, with 2N, that is the diploid number, being 22, being the most frequent. However, polyploid counts of 2N equals 40, and 2N equals 44 were recorded for accessions DD98-4 and accession L6 respectively. The polyploid counts were exact multiples of the diploid numbers, suggesting occurrence of polyploid cultivars of the species. The high seed yield, large fruit size, and weight observed for L6 are reflections of Geiger's effects, characteristics of polyploid genomes. Normally, most organisms exist at the diploid level, that is 2N. But then there are some that will be multiplied either by two or by three. And they have what we call Geiger's effects. We observe this in melon. And we observe that for those that have 2N equal, being equal to 40 or 44, they have high seed yield. They have large fruit size and large fruit weight. They were polyploid. So we reported polyploid genome in a goosey melon. And these are the pictures we found there. The various egusi types, which we eat, bara, 
shareware and all of that. These are the things we looked out for in all the 20 accessions that we evaluated. And then we saw some, the picture on the right, being that the fruit, the fruit size is extremely large. It's very large, larger than the normal fruit size. And then the accessions, we found some that are 2 n equals 44, while there are some that 2 n, the diploid is 2 n equals 22. That's the normal, the standard, but we had 2 n equals 44. And then let's now go to the other side, other aspect of the works that we did. We have thus far looked at the hybridization inheritance studies and genetic analysis studies in our indigenous crops. But we also did a lot of work on assessing genetic diversity in crop species. And remember, we talked about genetic diversity earlier on, which measures the variability that exists in particular germplasm. A study was conducted to determine the diversity present in 18 West African okra, a Bermoscus kelai, the Eli Roku, accessions, using 10 morphological characters. Metroglyph analysis classified the accessions into seven groups. The overlapping and discrete nature of the range of index score among the seven groups suggested that some genotypes shared similar morphological variation. You know, metroglyph analysis was one of the I mean, canonical analysis was one of the analyses that we considered earlier in terms of measuring genetic diversity. So we use it to examine the diversity that is present in AKLI. And we observe this, that it's grouped those accessions into seven. The importance of the grouping is to say that a plant breeder who wants to improve for any of these traits will look at parents from different groups. You don't pick parents from the same group because normally it means the parents in the same group are very similar genetically. And we observed seven groups. In another study, we sought to identify the major characters responsible for the, vari responsible for the variation in 20 accessions of a goosey melon using principal component analysis and single linkage cluster analysis. What this does, what these methods, what they do is the fact that they will help us to group these accessions, these 20 accessions into different groups based on the morphological characters that we're measuring. And we observed that the first three principal components accounted for 76.33% and 78.78 of the total variation in the early and late seasons, respectively. We did that study in two seasons in the year. And single linkage cluster analysis summarized the relationships among the accessions at various levels of similarity into a dendrogram, while the accessions were sorted into six different groups. The study identified accession L4 as early maturing and high yielding. And as I said earlier on, these are ways in which we introduce plants into the cropping system for improved agronomic performance. Similarly, similarly, the phylogenetic diversity and relationships among 50 Egusi melon accessions were measured using 25 simple sequence repeat SSR marker analysis. We also did that. So we evaluated based on morphology. We also evaluated based on this simple sequence repeat markers analysis. And we have here the values, the aging values, and the percentage of total variation that we observe. This is the dendrogram. The dendrogram will try to link all these accessions together to show us their relatedness. How are they related to one another? All this will be to help the plant breeder in determining which parent to choose in the process of making crosses and coming up with new varieties. A total, using the SSR marker, a total of 49 bands were scored, of which 42 of them were polymorphic, accounting for 93.60% of the polymorphic loci. The polymorphic importation information content, we call it PIC value, ranged from 0 0.36 to 0 0.80, which was quite high in this. And this study identified promising genotypes for early flowering and high yield in melon breeding programs, while revealing extensive range of genetic diversity represented in the melon accessions. 
principal component analysis was carried out on pooled sequence related amplified polymorphism, the SRAP technique, and simple sequence repeat markers, and three dimension plot is shown in figure eight. We observed a high level of allelic diversity and polymorphism of SRAP and SSR markers, which were due to the extensive range of genetic diversity present in the Egusi melon accessions. However, SSR markers, simple sequence repeat markers, revealed higher levels of genetic polymorphism than did the SRAP markers. So that's also to help us to evaluate these two marker systems, which one is better than the other. And the number of alleles, polymorphism, and PIC are given in this table. And this one too, showing the distinguishing morphological features of each group. This is the three-dimensional plot of the 50 Agusi melon accessions, which shows us the relationship between them. And then the germination and regeneration of the different Agusi melon seed types were carried out on Murashige and Scoop medium, supplemented with antibiotics. And it showed that one of the accessions, we called it A22, had a high survival rate, which will make it a useful material for regeneration and for subsequent transformation. All this also will be with a view to coming up with better varieties of Egusi melon. Morphological characterization and classification of genetic diversity in 29 accessions of cultivated okra, a Bermuscus esculentus, was carried out using PCA and SSCA. The first four principal axes accounted for over 60% of the total variation among the 18 characters describing the accession. While PCA classified the accessions into six clusters, single linkage cluster analysis group them into five clusters. So this tells us that some of these methods will give us different classifications. But then what all they are trying to do is to tell us the relationship between all these accessions and the jump plasm, and which will help us as breeders and those who want to do improvement work to really know where to pick your parents and what other characters will you look out for in these different groups. In order to further ascertain the level of diversity, present within the 29 accessions, which were collected from different agroecological zones of Nigeria. Genomic DNA from young apical shoots were extracted and analyzed by the RAPD technique. 84 amplified products and 53 RAPD bands were scored with an average of 61.4% of them revealing polymorphism, that is wide variability within and across the accessions. The dendrogram revealed five distinct clusters. The results of the RAPD analysis revealed that the use of 24 nanogram concentration of DNA produced better results in terms of DNA reproducibility. And that's the important thing here. We're looking at the reproducibility of the DNA content. This observation will reduce the limitations of DNA reproducibility in PCR due to small DNA concentration. It will also help in minimizing the cost of running this analysis, since DNA concentration as low as 24 nanograms will produce reasonable results. So you don't need to look for large volumes of the DNA test material. Diversity studies using molecular markers establish much more distinct relationship between assertions than morphological methods which are based mainly on phenotypic expressions. That is what you can see by the eyes that are subject also to environmental influences. For those that are done using morphological, I mean, using molecular analysis, those ones are not subject to environmental analysis, the molecular markers. Now, another crop that we also worked upon, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, is the African yam bean, Sphenostylis tenokapa. It is a tuberous legume crop indigenous to tropical Africa. Its prominence and genetic resources have been declining. We observe this. And this thereby necessitated urgent research efforts to prevent imminent extinction. Genetic divergence in 80 genotypes. We went across the entire Southwest, collected 80 genotypes, mostly indigenous to Nigeria, 
And this was examined by using the principal component analysis and the hierarchical cluster analysis involving 62 qualitative and quantitative characters. The total genetic variation observed among these genotypes was explained by 61 axes of the principal component analysis with the three axes accounting for 40.37 of the total variation. The hierarchical cluster analysis classified all the 80 genotypes of the African yam bean that we studied into groups on the basis of average distance between clusters at 1.00 point of inflection. And it was observed that for this crop, African yam bean, tuber, pod, seed, and pigmentation characteristics were important components of the wide genetic variability between African yam bean genotypes that we studied. This is the African yam bean. Well, some people may look at it as yam. It's not really the kind of yam that will eat like yam, but it has tuberous roots that we have here, but it also has seeds that are also consumed in many localities. So that is the crop. It really grows like yam, but then it is not really yam in that sense, but it has tuberous um, roots that we harvested. And these are the results. The other thing, Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, that we looked at was the tea plant. We know that tea is widely consumed, not only in Nigeria, but all over the world. But in this country, we import most of the tea that we consume. However, for some of those who know, tea is also produced in Nigeria. It's produced actually mainly in Mambila Plateau. It's produced, we have the Mambila Plateau and Mambila Plateau tea that is produced in this country. However, we sought to look at the possibility of bringing tea cultivation from that environment to the southwestern part of Nigeria. And so, in a bid to ensure the cultivation of tea, Camellia sinensis, beyond the upland ecologies of Nigeria, that's the Mambila Plateau, GG by plot methodology was used to analyze yield data of 34 genotypes of tea in three environments to identify high yielding, stable, and adapted genotypes. The three environments that we studied were Ibadan in rainforest, Mambila in the mountain forest, and Mayoselbe and Mayoselbe in woodland forest over a period of two years. Genotype C143, NGC18, C357, and C318 were the best high yielding and most stable across all the tested environment, suggesting that they are stable and they are suitable for these environments. And these particular varieties that we have here, the, some were adapted well to the Mbado environment, while some adapted well to the Mambila environment. But of much significance to us was the fact that some of these varieties were adapted to the Ibadan environment. Hence, we can successfully cultivate some of these tea varieties in the Ibadan environment, not just in the Mambila Plateau area. And it was concluded that Mambila environment represented the best in terms of the ideal environment for tea cultivation in Nigeria, while Ibadan was the most discriminating environment, telling us the performance of all the genotypes, and Mayoselbe was the most representative. And this is the tree plant, the tea plant. You will see the leaves are the ones that are processed into the tea that we consume. Finally, you, of course, you won't see the leaves, but it's the tea that is processed. And these are the GG by plot and the things. And we also considered caffeine, protein, and crude content. These are the major constituents in tea. Some people don't like caffeine in their tea. Why some like it? So we looked at all these three major, major constituents. And these substances are naturally occurring in tea leaves. And significant variations were observed in the genotypes with respect to the environments under study, which indicated that the genotypes accumulated, and this is very significant too, the genotypes accumulated caffeine, protein, and crude content. Huh? differently in different environments. The correlation coefficient among them, among the protein, caffeine, and crude fiber are shown in the figure that we have there. And the correlation coefficients of the three proximate analysis 
in the T germ plasm that we studied. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, in conclusion, the lack of knowledge of the genetic diversity inherent in a club, crop germ plasm will lead to limited progress in the improvement of the crop. Our studies of several indigenous crop species, melon, okra, West African okra, African yam bean, and tea, revealed large diversity and a broad genetic base in these crops, implying a great potential in their utilization. Using morphological and molecular characterization techniques, we classify the sessions of these crops into distinct clusters with considerable differences and high levels of polymorphism between the groups. We also identify some promising genotypes with traits like early maturity, high seed yield, high adaptability to specific environments, suitable growth habits, and so on and so forth. This has facilitated the maintenance and further acquisition of germplasm resources as well as the incorporation of specific genes governing desired traits for the development of improved crop varieties. Also, we carried out experiments aimed at enabling a better understanding of the gene systems operating in the expression of many morphological and yield traits. The results from heritability and genetic analysis studies indicated the extent to which characters can be transmitted from one generation to another generation. They also served as valuable tools that can be used to predict the magnitude of genetic gain that will follow selection of these characters. Of course, the major remarkable features of both natural selection, which occurs in nature, that has no hand of man in it, that the remarkable features of natural selection and artificial selection as carried out during genetic and plant breeding experiments. When we carry out these procedures, we're actually doing artificial selection. That the result, the major features, is that while some traits maintain continuity from generation to generation, others experience discontinuity, and they fail to progress from one generation to another generation. This are my recommendations that will help in genetic and plant breeding experiments, as well as improving the agricultural system in Nigeria. Looking at the agricultural sector over the years, and with my involvement in this sector, I wish to recommend as follows. There must be adequate funding and sustained efforts for plant genetic resources exploration, collection, characterization, and conservation in Nigeria for both cultivated species and their wild relatives. This has become very essential if we don't want to endanger the next generation of Nigerians. Relevant authorities and agencies should ensure regular review of existing national legislations backing plant genetic resources conservation and utilization. And concerted efforts must also be made to enforce these laws. Of course, we have the National Center for Genetic Resources and Biotechnology. And this center is actually in the forefront of genetic resources conservation in Nigeria. But we're saying that some laws govern all these activities, and these laws must be regularly reviewed in the country. Thirdly, federal and state governments need to demonstrate sincere commitment towards research activities by increasing the funding made available to universities and research institutes. We cannot overemphasize this. There is a need to bridge the gap between university researchers and scientists at the national research institutes with a view to enhancing research outputs in the agricultural value chain, which will ensure food security in the country. I wish to say that presently, we seem to have some bit of disconnect between our universities and the research institutes. This should not be. And I hope as scientists and researchers, this will be addressed in the very near future. But coming back home, the existing synergy and collaboration between the Institute for Food Security, Environmental Resources and Agricultural Research, our own IFSERA, Agricultural Media Resources and Extension Center, our own AMREC, and relevant colleges in this university should be further strengthened so as to carry out demand-driven, farmer-centered, and problem-solving researches 
that will justify the existence of the Federal University of Agriculture, Abe Okuta. Number six, our university should also continue to develop human capacity and material resources in biotechnology, which should be deployed towards promoting agricultural research and food production in our catchment area. Yes, it's prone to abuse, but as a university, we have started it, but we must continue to develop human capacity and material resources in biotechnology. Nigeria must not shy away from the cultivation and use of genetically modified crops. So for those who are not scientists here, please do not be scared. Once the appropriate legislations and controls are put in place, we shouldn't shy away from them. Concerned regulatory authorities should, however, ensure that such crops meet biosafety standards. That's the important thing to note. And finally, sustained efforts should be made to mitigate the current negative effects of climate change at national and local levels in order to enhance agricultural research and production activities. A lot, we're suffering a lot in this regard because of the climate change that we are currently going through. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, I am not a self-made man. In the course of my sojourn in life, a lot of people, too numerous to mention, have contributed to my progress. However, my greatest appreciation goes to my maker and heavenly father, Jehovah Almighty, my savior and master, the Lord Jesus Christ, and my helper and strengthener, the Holy Spirit. I am what I am today by the grace of God. All glory be to God Almighty. My gratitude goes to all my teachers at every level of my academic pursuit. St. Peter's Primary School, Ake Abe Okuta, Abe Okuta Grammar School. And in this regard, I want to specially recognize the memory of Pa Frederick Ola Ori Dota the principal at Abeokta Grammar School. He was my principal and a disciplinarian. May his soul rest in peace. And also at Ogun State Polytechnic, now Moshida Polar Polytechnic for my A-level and the University of Ibadan for my degree certificates. They taught, encouraged, molded, and mentored me to become who I am today. As many as they are, special mention must be made of my academic father who instilled in me the virtues of humility hard work, punctuality, honesty, and moderation. I'm talking of no other person than Professor Iyola Fawole. Is my guy in the hall? Professor Iyola Fawole, he promised to be here, probably will join us. He took me in as my final year project supervisor, trained me for the MSc research work, and released me to the labor market after he thoroughly supervised my PhD thesis. I'm deeply grateful to him. May he live long to reap the fruits of his labor. Of course, I'm also grateful to a worthy teacher and mentor, Professor Timothy Oluroti Mitayo. You can stand up for recognition, sir. Professor T. Otayo brought me to UNAB. In fact, my appointment letter read Mr. Obi Kaindi, Kia Professor T. Otayo, is an epitome of discipline, hard work, and focused intellectual pursuits. Thank you, sir. Of course, the pioneer vice chancellor of this university, Professor Nuruddin Olorun Nimbe Adedipai, who taught me at the University of Ibadan and interviewed me for my appointment here, also deserves special mention. He's a thoroughbred academic and administrator who encouraged me to develop as a boarding academic. I also appreciate the other former vice chancellors, Professor Julius Okoje, late Professor Israel Adu, and Professor Oluwafemi Balogun. Professor Oluwashola Oyewole, as well as the former acting vice chancellors, Professor, Professor Ishola Adamson and Professor Adi Enikumei, my own brother and friend. Professor Enikumei, you are welcome. I thank them for the opportunities they gave me to serve this university. However, Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, please permit me to accord special recognition and thanks to Professor Oluwafemi Olaya Balogun. During whose tenure, or guy, you may stand up for recognition, sir. It was during his tenure that I had the most opportunities to be my best and contribute my best so far to the development of this university. Of course, I'm also very grateful.
to our current Vice Chancellor, Professor Felix Kolawole Salako. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, do as your deputy. I want to ask you to please stand up for special recognition. Professor Felix Kolawole Salako, who is both a loving brother and a worthy leader. He's so passionate and committed to the development of our university, as attested by the giant strides and achievements recorded thus far. Thank you, sir, for the opportunities you gave to me, and may the Lord continue to strengthen you. At this juncture, I must also appreciate the immediate past Vice Chancellor of Lagos State University, Professor Olanri Wajwa de Gonfagbon. Unfortunately, he's not able to be here for one reason or the other. He called me yesterday and really pleaded that because of this, he won't be able to. He's a senior advocate of Nigeria and National Productivity Order of Merit Award winner. He gave me the opportunity not only to have my sabbatical leave at Lasso, but also appointed me the pioneer attending of the School of Agriculture, Lagos State University. He gave my team and I the, at the school the support we needed, and this culminated in unprecedented infrastructural development and full accreditation by the NUC for our program in just about two years of establishment. He's such a pragmatic and transformative leader. I would like to appreciate the goodwill that I have received from the entire academic, technical, and administrative staff of this university. Please, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I have spent 27 years, going to 28 now, in this university. And I can say, with all sense of humility, right from the lowest to the highest, I have enjoyed great goodwill. I want to thank you so very much, and I really appreciate the relationship. Thank you so very much. Space constraints, space constraints will not allow me to list everyone. Please, I want to plead that you please understand with me. For space constraints, I cannot list everyone. But special thanks should go to the dean of my college, Professor Jeremiah Jonathan Atungu. Also to my dear friend, and media past dean, Professor M.O. Atayeshi, my head of department, and a friend of 35 years, Professor Mrs. M. A. Ayobon. We both studied under Professor Aifa Wale. All the academic staff of the Department of Plant Breeding and Seed Technology, I want to appreciate you so much, especially our most senior, OJ himself. Where is OJ? Professor OJ Ariyo. Please, can you stand up for recognition? He's in the house. He should be somewhere. Professor OJ Ariyo. Thank you, sir. That's him over there, Professor OJ Ariyo. All the academic and non teaching staff of Copeland, what will I do without you? Special attention must be made of some senior colleagues whom we have worked together in this university and who have impacted me positively. They include Professor M.T. Adetunji, the former dean of my college. Professor S.T. Olagoke, former deputy vice chancellor of development. Professor S.O. Afolami, former vice chancellor of Augustine University. Epe, I think he should be around somewhere too. Professor Emmanuel Babatunde Ogutono, former dean, College of Animal Science and Livestock Production. Professor Mrs. Daisy Rubetini, Professor CFI Omuka, Professor T.A. Arugulu, Professor Arugulu, where are you? Somewhere there, Professor Arugulu, thank you, sir. Professor Tokmek Mokwola, Professor Sam Oluwalano, and Professor Tunde Ajayi. I also appreciate the special friendship of Professor J.J. Atungu, Professor Ade Oshun, F.I. Ade Oshun, and Dr. Ade Shubayo. The three of us went to Lagos State University School of Agriculture to go and give what FUNAB is capable of doing in that university. To my numerous former and present research students, both undergraduates and postgraduates, thank you for your dedication and hard work, including your contributions to some of the research results presented in this lecture. Special mention must be made of my past doctoral students. Professor C.C. Nwagburuka, Cyril, is now a professor at the Babcock University. Dr. Adewale Adeniji, Dr. Babawale Daniel, both of Foye, and Dr. Emmanuel Ohio Simwa Idehe of UNAB here. Dr. O. O. Olaniyi of Koko Research Institute. My special appreciation goes to Professor Mrs. Helena Dukebodunde, the chairperson of UNA Publications Committee for efforts in editing the manuscript of this lecture, and also to Mr. Ayodele, Ayodeji Famubele for his editorial assistance. My special appreciation also goes to the royal fathers who have taken me as their son. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming his Royal Majesty, Oba Michael Adedotun Aremogadebo, Okukeno the Fourth, the Alake and Paramount ruler of a bad land. Kabiesio, 
Of course, join me also to welcome His Royal Majesty, Oba Dr. Adedapo Adewale Teju Osho Onomiyo, the Oshile of Okeono Eba, Kabiesio, Kabiesio. But do people call it Kabiesio? When Kabiesio was alighting from the vehicle, I was so surprised. Ah, he was a little Thank you, Kabiesio. His Royal Majesty, my own King, Oba Saburi, Baba Jide Bakre, the Agura of Bagura, Kabiesio. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, being an ardent believer in and a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, I must appreciate my spiritual leaders. Top among them is my pastor, my spiritual coach, my mentor, my Bible teacher, my brother, my confidant, and a man after God's heart, Reverend Akintude Joshua Moso. He has been all of the above to me since 1996 when both of us met, and I am blessed to have him in my life. His wife, Reverend Mrs. Kemi Amoson, who also happens to be my pastor and sister, is also well appreciated for her support and encouragement all these years. I also appreciate every member of Rock Foundation Church Abekuta for their love, prayers, and support. Sincere appreciation also goes to my Lord Spiritual, Bishop Samuel Oludele Ogundeji, the Lord Bishop of Eba West Anglican Diocese. You are welcome, sir. Thank you so very much. And also, Bishop Emmanuel Oluda Isiadekunle, my own Egbo, the Lord Bishop of Egba Anglican Diocese, and other ministers, and also Venerable Dr. Peter Ayuade, the Vicar of Holy Trinity Anglican Church, Bagura Abeokuta, and other ministers of the gospel who have been of significant blessings to me and my family. I thank every member of the Abeokuta Club. Ireo, Ireo and Egba Science Education Foundation for their love and support. The Kende Dynasty in Bagura Land, Abeokuta, is such a large one, and I've enjoyed tremendous goodwill and brotherhood among them. On a lighter note, this is not surprising, since it was claimed that I'm a reincarnation of one of their progenitors and a strong pillar in the dynasty, who was also my grandfather, Chief Christopher Emmanuel Kende, the former Ekeni of Egba Christians. I came into the world a few months after he died, hence the name given to me, Babatunde. Though that didn't prevent my dad from beating me when I was young. And somebody jokingly told him, you are beating your father. The first grandchild of Chief Christopher Emmanuel Kende is Emeritus Professor Olufumilaya Yokade Bambo. Big mommy. She it was who prevailed upon me to change my course of study from agricultural economics, which I chose as first option in Jamba admission, to agricultural biology in order to study plant breeding and genetics. She also prevailed upon me not to leave the University of Ibadan until I backed the PhD degree, which I complied with. Thank you, Ma, for your foresight. May you live long to reap the fruits of your labor. Special appreciation also goes to Bashono Festus Oladi Jikainde, the Balogun de Rebagura, that's the Balogun of the Rebagura. My other uncles, aunties, cousins, nephews, and nieces, worthy of deep gratitude are my siblings. My parents gave birth to four, and the four of us are still alive today. We give all the glory to God. Mrs. Olufumilayo Lawa, that's my senior sister. I'm the second born. Pastor Mrs. Oluye Misi Bolani Wadun Ayo, she's the third born. She came after me. And of course, our own Dr. Benga Kende of Colvert, whom we all know. Benga, that's him over there. I also appreciate my age-long friends, Pharmacist Badejo Ayinde, the somewhere in the crowd, Pastor Yomiade Yemi, and Professor A.B. Idowu, the Vice Chancellor of Samuel Adebuega University. We both roughed it together those days. My sincere appreciation must also go to the patriarch, who should ordinarily be my father-in-law, but he has assumed the role of my father, Prince Ezekiel Ajibade Aderibibe of Aro Mole Ubumosho. Daddy, thank you for holding forth and being there for us all the time. May the Lord grant you long life. I also thank Pastor Olayin in Kabolani Wadunayo. That's my brother-in-law and all my wife's siblings, both home and abroad. I equally appreciate all members of my mother's family, the ECME royal family of Isaliawori, 
Baton Ota in Ogun State. Special thanks go to Princess Musumola Adi Oshun. That's my mom. You are welcome, ma. And also, Princess Bumili Gali. Princess Bumili Gali. You are welcome, ma. And Prince Adesonya. To the vehicles who brought me into this world, my father, late Chief Samuel Olayin Kakende, the former Balogun of Bagura Christians, and my mother, late Chief Mrs. Elizabeth Olan Riwaju Kakende, the former Yaijo of Holy Trinity Anglican Church, Bagura Beokuta, thank you all for your labor of love and care. You cherish the education and endeavor to give us quality education and proper moral and spiritual upbringing. We shall continue to remember you with fond memories. May your gentle souls continue to rest in peace. In the year 1992, while on academic sojourn at the University of Ibadan, I came across a young, intelligent, and innocent soul by the name Yabu Adekemi Adelibibe. Sparks flew, hearts blended. The Lord intervened, and by November 2, 1996, we became husband and wife. Thus began a journey that has been a blessing to me in every area of my life. In the year 1992, that's her picture there. She has been a strong pillar of support and very understanding. Professor Mrs. Iyabode Adekemi Adelibibe, a professor of plant pathology, Federal University of Agriculture, Abeokuta, I doff my heart for you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I thank God for the angels that God has blessed us with. Comrade Oreolua Faith Kende. I say comrade because he's the current president, Association of Veterinary Medicine Students of Funab. So that's why we jokingly live our comrade. At least if your father cannot be a comrade, thank you for being a comrade. <laughs> that's Oreolua. Ibukunlua Joy. Ibukunlua Joy. That's our second born. And then the baby of the house. Ireulua, peace. Stand up now. Thank you so very much. She said, thank you so very much. And we have been blessed by God to be a happy family. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, principal officers of the university, distinguished colleagues, invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, greatest Funabites. I thank you most sincerely for your patience and attention. God bless you. However, Please join me to sing this song. I hope we'll be able to sing it even without the organs being available. Can they help us? Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father, because I've seen his faithfulness. And part of the faithfulness is the fact that I stand before you today to present the 70th inaugural of the Federal University of Agriculture at Bekuta on my 57th birthday. Today, I clock 57. Glory be to God Almighty. Glory be to God Almighty. Great is thy. You want to help us? Oh God, my Father, there is no shadow of turning within. Thou changest not. Thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Hallelujah. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new masses I sing. All I have need, thy hands are provided. Great is thy faithfulness. Lord unto me. The second stanza. Summer and winter and springtime and harvest. Sun, moon and stars 
in the courses above. Join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy and love. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning, thy morning, new mercies I see. All I have need, that thy hand has provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. And the last stanza, please, the last one. Pardon for sin, on a peace that endures. Nine on the presence to cheer. Plan to guide strength for today and a branch for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with ten thousand besides. Oh, yes, great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have need, that thy hands are provided. Great is thy faith. Lord unto me. Thank you so much for.